call it meeting in order. Uh, Randy Hick couldn't be here today, so uh, Sherry, she knew Mark. If Mark called me, I wouldn't be here. That I'd lay out, so Sherry called me and get me on her. Own. <laughs> so I'm, I'm, I'm Randy today. The looks are a lot better. I can't hardly feel the shoes, but the looks are a lot better. So <laughs> Couple of things I wanted to mention here because I, you know, I talk too much, and that's what my city council tell me that meetings be quick if I quit talking. Uh, you don't see me dressed up very often, but this is it. You know, Mark hadn't got me this this vest here, but probably wouldn't have been that this dress. But uh, I started teaching school back in 1975. Now a lot of you people look around saying, "Why wasn't he born then?" Uh, but I started back a long time ago, and uh, I coached basketball for about 14 years, wore a tie at every game. Then I was uh, director of schools for 12 years, wore a tie every day for 12 years, pretty much every day. So when I retired from, from those things back quite a few years ago, my ties went in the closet, and I've had them out once or twice, and one of them was whenever I married my son. Uh, preacher at church one day with him sitting there said, now Mayor, did you know you can marry people right in the middle of church? I said, oh no, I didn't know that. And so uh, then right after that, six months after that, him and his wife were getting married and uh, that was during COVID. Well, the week before, the week before the wedding, COVID hit the preacher. And he says, well, Dad, you know you said that if I need you, well, it wasn't really serious. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so I spent a week trying to get ready to do something I've never even attempted or thought about before. But it worked real well. It worked fine. So, uh, so that that happened, and that was uh, good. And it's got some good memories of it. And second thing, lucky to be here. About a little over five weeks ago, I had a re knee replacement, and. Uh, I did make it to the last meeting because I sat over, right over there. And since then, and it's uh, it's worked fine. I told Sherry, I said, it's very painful. Men, now I'm going to tell you this, men are not nearly as tough as women. My <laughs> wife had two knees replaced. She went through it, and I thought they were going to kill me when I was on that table of therapy. I was yelling and screaming, but uh, we got over it. We got over it, and... And fortunately, I can kind of, if I make myself, I can walk pretty, pretty fair. I'm trying to get ready for golf season. So, but, uh, but uh, I'm ready to have you today, so I'm here. So uh, glad everybody's here. And uh, Jerry, have a roll call. Randy Hetty, Sam Gibson. Here. Marvin Love. Charlie Whitaker. Here. Keisha Richards. Here. Cindy Putnam. Zach Gilpin. Terry Dunn. Christy Pavin, here. Marie Fran, Bill Gibson, Ann Stamps, here. Michael Burton, <coughs> Misty Fife, Barbara Wheeler, here. Don Hollingsworth, here. Bob Dupree, here. Linda Pastry, here. Marilyn Davis, here. All right, we got a quorum here, I assume. I'm ready. I uh, have a motion to approve the minutes. You see your packet there? I motion to approve them. Second. Got a motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. Uh, motion. It's approved. All right. And I told Mark here, I said, now Mark, some of these things I'm going to leave to you because this is new to me. So, Mark. All right. We'll have Linnell Gotti do our CSPG report. So. Good morning, everyone. Um, hope everybody's doing well today. I want to spend just a few minutes um, before I jump into the dashboard explaining why I'm at every policy council meeting talking about our dashboards and our numbers. In addition to us being a human resource agency, we're also designated as a community action agency. And by having that designation, it's our job to help promote self-sufficiency. And the main core funding to be a community action agency is that CSBG or that Community Services Block Grant. So there are some HRAs that are designated community action agencies, and then there are standalone community action agencies. In Tennessee, there are 20 organizations that are considered community action agencies. Out of those 20, 
the Delta or the Memphis HRA, East Tennessee HRA, South Central, Southeast, and South Central HRA, I had that on their slide, are all designated community action agencies. <coughs> By being that and having that designation, there are 50 organizational standards that we have to meet, not just for that program, but agency-wide. And out of those 50 standards, there are standards that apply specifically to our policy council and our board, such as signing conflicts of interest forms. That's a requirement to receive these funds, so that's why Charity's always asking every year for folks to sign those. Also, it's required in that statute and those organizational centers that I'm before you at every meeting, giving you the opportunity to ask questions about our program and also providing you with what we're doing and new initiatives. So that's another reason I do that. But also, you guys um, approve things that, that we can do and make recommendations up to the board. And so all of that is just a daily part of things that we have to do. And sometimes I don't think that we explain things in enough detail. I'm just always here presenting numbers. So I wanted to take that and let you know. Now, if you're interested in seeing all those organization standards, I'm very happy to send them out to you. I could also send out the ones that are specific to the board um, if you're interested in that. So that was a little spill. I just wanted to get everybody, you know, a little more familiar because you'll hear us more talking about community action agencies, community action agencies. Also, something that we have to do is make sure that you guys are aware of our bylaws and how they operate. So you have a copy of your bylaws in your folder that you guys can always refer back to. You can take them. I think Sherry and I were talking about just maybe leaving them in the binder so that you guys can always refer to those at every meeting and not have to worry about bringing your own copy. So we put that in there. And um, we, a lot of times, talk at our April meeting about strategic planning. We did that last year. However, we transitioned and have a two-year strategic plan, so we won't have to talk about that today. Um, so if there's anything related to community action and HRA, make sure you guys reach out if you want more clarification. So in your packets, you're going to see dashboards for January and February. January, you know, was kind of a slower month. Um, didn't have as many services, still rocked out. But I wanted to focus on that February board. We definitely picked up with LAHI. Um, we know at our last meeting we were talking about overwhelmed some of the offices were due to sickness and different things. I wanted to let everybody know LAHI is back up to speed, rocking along like it should. Um, you can see how many folks that we actually assisted in that February. You also wanted to point out the THDA, um, our rent program. It's an emergency assistance program. You can see in February there was zero numbers. That program had been paused. It is rocking and rolling now. So at our next dashboard, you guys are going to start seeing increases in folks being served in all 14 counties along with that dollar amount. The LIWAP program, that's our water assistance program, and remember we had good discussions on that at our last meeting because it ended in March. But I did want to, to brag on all of our county offices, our utility partners, and everyone. Last Thursday and Friday, was a, last Wednesday and Thursday were the last two days that we, everyone was going to be in the office and be open to assist folks. So on Thursday, we spent $25,000 in water assistance through the 14 counties. At the end of the day, we looked and we had $55,000 to go. We needed to spend $55,000 helping people on Thursday. So all the county staff, we all got together and I was like, well, what are your thoughts on a social media post? I know it's going to overwhelm and I know it's going to get crazy and everybody was like, let's do it. I think that's probably the most shared post we've ever had on our social media page. It was well over 100 shares. Our utility districts jumped right in with us. Our partners were sharing this left and right. And so out of that $55,000, we were able to spend $49,090.72 in one day serving people with water. And a lot of those were at $250 a week. So it's a smaller amount. We were able to help folks that had been turned off, had a leak, had bigger bills. But I just wanted to really give a shout out to our counties and our partners for helping get this money into the hands of folks that needed it with their water assistance. So um, thank you very much for that. And does anybody have any questions about the dashboards or anything that I've spoke on?
give you um, the information. But really, if, if you hear something and you want to uh, talk about it, let's have a dialogue. We can talk about it today. Um, or if I don't know the answer to your question, which the likelihood of that's pretty high, uh, I'll find it out and we can uh, we can have further discussions. Um, so I'm really happy to have both Marjan Atta and Hannah Arn. Um, Marjan is the Governor's Management Fellow. Um, she works for the office, it's called CFG, Customer Focused Government. And uh, like Mr. Farley said, this was a program um, that the Governor Lee's administration uh, has really bolstered. It, it started under Governor Haslam, um, but we're really excited to have Marjan to kind of make the connections with all the different state departments. Um, and then Hannah Arn uh, came from uh, TCAT as well. Um, she spearheaded the Music and Memory Program, which I know the folks in Upper Cumberland, y'all were such champions for, we couldn't have done it without you. Um, but Hannah's come over to stand here too to bring her expertise um, to kind of help support this plan as well. Okay, Holly, what should I do here? <laughs> I don't want to mess up this awesome, beautiful. Oh. Did I know that? No. <laughs> um, so, Mr. Burley alluded, Tim here, uh, we applied for um, what was called a learning collaborative opportunity uh, with 10 other states, and we were afforded this, um, this opportunity um, to learn about the multi-sector plan for aging and how we could uh, start that process in Tennessee. This has been a long and ongoing process, um, over 10 plus years of work, that have fed into this plan. Um, and we're just really excited to have the work um, in a plan and so that individuals can use it, add to it, modify it. Um, it is not a set plan, but please know that, that your stakeholder feedback is, is always welcome um, and, and needed. And if you don't know, the division of Tim here uh, serves as the state Medicaid agency. Um, so where the programs that Holly mentioned serve non-Medicaid eligible, uh, Tim here serves those, those uh, folks that are Medicaid eligible. So this is probably a map that you hopefully are very familiar with. Um, this is the population projections for 2030, which you think, oh, 2030, that's forever away. It's not. Everything you think about knows that. Um, and this map was developed by um, a partnership with the East Tennessee uh, State University, um, their Office of uh, Rural Development. Um, this information is open to the public. This is just a snapshot of it, um, but there's lots and lots and lots of data resources on this da data dashboard um, that we hope that, that individuals will, will use. Um, it shows you today's projections, and then it shows you 2030. So if you're like me and you're super interested, okay, the state, yes, but what about uh, where we live, where we work? You guys can see uh, in the Upper Cumberland, you're quickly, quickly aging. Uh, your population um, is the fastest growing, it says 65 plus, um, and so that's why you know, programs and services that uh, that the HRA, the Development District, and the AAAD provide, and the Community Action, uh, the CAC, are so needed. Go ahead, please. Uh, just uh, for your, if somebody's having trouble seeing, we do have a copy in your notebook there. You you should be able to find. And the key is, the darker you are, the older you are. So just <laughs> if you look up there on the map now, of course Putnam County is is a little skewed because of Tennessee Tech and all the young right. people that go to school there. The rest of us are all pretty purple there, yes. <laughs> dark yes. red. Yeah. Um, and so programs and services are needed today and they're definitely needed in the future, which is why we needed um, a strategic plan to kind of think ahead. Um, so we have lots of planning efforts. You guys around the table are constantly planning and thinking um, about the Upper Cumberland and how to support uh, you and, and the people, your neighbors, your friends. Um, but the multi-sector plan is really to help look into the future. We know that, that the population is growing. Uh, we know that we need to support caregivers. Um, we know we need to support ourselves because we do our duty. Um, so that's really what, what an MPA is. So it's state-led, it's multi-year. Um, if, you're, if you're a person like me that likes planning, this is really exciting. If you're a person that's like, eh, whatever, there's probably some really good information in, in this plan for you too. Um, so this MPA 
will help guide the state. Um, it can provide information to local programs. Um, we really want to help support regional, county, city, local, local efforts, even if that means getting out of the way. You know, we really want to want to help support um, through this plan as well. We hope that it will encourage public and private initiatives. I'm going to show you um, a couple of those today. Um, changing policies, and then, like Mr. Farley said, and of course, uh, resources and, and funding. Um, that second point reflects extensive input from, from the community. That's really where, where we want to hear from you um, about what you want to see in this plan um, and how, how will we make this plan a work for, for everybody going forward. So I mentioned the Learning Collaborative earlier. Uh, these are the members um, that participated in that 2022. It's a year-long effort. Um, so lots of lots of folks represented it there. Um, got lots of input, lots of help from um, our the national organization, CHGS, that was running this. Um, I'd say we're one of the 10 states, we're kind of middle of the road when it comes to developing and implementing. Um, if you want to see a state that's fully implemented and, and running well, Florida is a really good example. Um, California is a good example, Colorado, uh, and Texas. Those are some states that are, that are actively um, implementing. Um, I think Texas plan has been around 1998, so maybe when you were in that, in that high school, we're in that high, it's probably when they were starting their, their plan. So this is kind of a visual representation of all of the stakeholder involvement um, and kind of how we're going, not only top down, but also, also bottom up. And hearing from, from everybody around um, what, would it, what would it look like for an MPA. Everybody has a different piece of this puzzle that we want to work together to kind of put together um, and, and really assist older adults and caregivers today and in the future. So this is where we're at today as far as the multi-sector plans development. So we did a, a pretty good deep dive on uh, existing aging initiatives. There's so much going on in our city uh, to help support older adults, which is really, really encouraging. Uh, finding that information continues to prove be, uh, be difficult, especially when you're in a crisis um, and you need help immediately. Um, so we really wanted to see what, what was going on, um, different grant opportunities, and what was kind of coming down the pipe as far as initiatives go. Um, the Learning Collaborative offered a little bit of money um, to help with the data dashboard. So we partnered with BTSU. Um, while they have a rural focus, they also didn't want to, they wanted to include all um, suburban and urban in the data dashboard. Um, so they pulled together different metrics um, to look at the county level. Uh, we'd love to get kind of the zip code level, um, but you guys know in, in Upper Cumberland, more rural you are, the harder it is to get to that data. Um, we talked to a lot of people. We surveyed um, stakeholders mostly at the state level, about what they were currently doing, what goals that they were actively working on, trying to connect some dots around um, what the MPA, um, and kind of build momentum for what the MPA priorities should be. Then we landed on uh, five goals um, for, for Tennessee's MPA. Um, we did look to other states, and if you do do a little Google search, um, our MPA looks very similar to Florida's MPA. Um, and so we saw the success that Florida was able to do, and we wanted to implement that. Uh, and right now we're drafting on working recommendations. Uh, we've had uh, in-person stakeholder events across the state, a uh, heard recommendation, kind of compiling those and seeing kind of things throughout. And then, uh, and then we're developing the final plan um, that will be presented to Care leadership, the governor's office, um, and eventually will be moved to the department that, um, that Holly mentioned, um, so that they'll be able to, to really implement uh, the recommendations. So on your screen now, you'll see the, the MPA goals. Um, I hope you see your work, your priorities, your passions represented in these goals. Um, I hope you see that these goals 
while they're separate, five, they're so interconnected. And where uh, one feeds into the other, um, or where one change could really help help support um, all five uh, all five goals. Um, ten year is represented in probably two three of these goals. Um, we wouldn't necessarily be the champion of all five, um, and which is really indicative of how this plan is um, multi plan, multi sector, multi state led. So just know that Tim Care isn't doing every single thing that you see um, on this, but we're really helping support and, uh, and making changes where we we'll see that we need to make. So you guys in Upper Cumberland are way ahead of the game on this. And we've taken a lot of the information that you have implemented and have been successful um, and really trying to put it into the plan to help show other local communities um, how they, they how they can support um, older adults. So you'll see um, a, a couple different age-friendly communities um, in the Upper Cumberland. Um, we can always use more, and if you're interested in kind of what an age-friendly community would be, uh, AARP is really leading leading those efforts. They work with mayors and local city councils uh, to make policy changes uh, that can uh, that can help support the little community, which is really exciting. But as you can see, Upper Cumberland, y'all are really rocking it. Uh, the second initiative that uh, local, regional, cities, states can uh, can help um, support is what we call age-friendly health systems. There are other age-friendly health systems in the state uh, and, in, and in Upper Cumberland, but we wanted to highlight this was specifically related to the multi-sector plan. Um, and so the, it's the IHI, the Institute for Healthcare Improvement. Um, they have what's called an age-friendly healthcare package. And that's working with hospitals and health systems to have the accreditation. I know this is shaking their head over here. They, they know. Um, but it's really to help support older adults when they do transition to the hospital and have a successful transition out of the hospital. Um, so these are the two recognized age-friendly health systems um, that we were able to support through the institute. And then last but not least, um, this is an um, a active project with our Tennessee Department of Health, um, and they call this age-friendly public health system. Um, so if I have any public health folks in the room, um, you know usually community pu county public health systems don't necessarily focus on um, 65 plus, uh, but age-friendly public health systems is trying to really promote that and help support if you do utilize the, the public health system, you know, connecting those dots for older adults and making caregiver, grandparents raising grandchildren is a really good example of how county health departments can help support that. So this is our timeline. You'll see we're sort of at that winter, spring. Um, we're sharing and developing ideas, which is why we're here today. And then we'll, uh, boom, you know how timelines are. Probably push out a little bit further because we want to make sure um, that we get a whole bunch of stakeholder input. So July, August, um, September for for that uh, presentation and final um, final plan. And last but not least, we want your feedback. There's a QR code. We're happy to share uh, the information. Please hear me loud and clear that um, yes, this survey is an opportunity to to hear feedback. I do recognize that it is only for people who have access to a computer, to Wi-Fi. Um, so that's really what, what we need your help to. It's for the individuals who do want to provide input but maybe don't have access. What are some good What are some good ways that we can uh, hear input from them too? And it's really working working through community partners um, like you uh, as well. So we want to know uh, feedback. If you have a, a really specific policy that you want to discuss, let us know. If you have a big, broad goal, let us know. Um, we we want to hear. We want to hear it all. Well, we're just really excited, and thank you for, for your time. And um, I hope this was helpful. And any questions or, or discussion, if, if we have time, happy happy to, to hear. We have a little discussion here. I, I want to take just a second. I, I want to talk about why this is so important to our region. Obviously, we were talking earlier 
when you look at how our communities are so far affected, you know, we've got far more people that are aging compared to other areas of the state. I mean, obviously we do have the dynamic in Cumberland County where they actively recruit retirees, and that probably skews their numbers just a little bit, but no other, no other community in Upper Cumberland is recruiting seniors and bringing it in and making it an older population. You know, when you think about what we're trying to do, our main focus is everything for the, the it doesn't, it's not just our aging programs, it's all of our programs. How do we provide a better quality of life and how do we keep people in their homes longer? You know, the, the one thing that we want to avoid is people moving into long-term care facilities. That's an immense cost. We want to try and avoid that at all possibilities. And nobody really wants to do that. Nobody wants to move into that that long-term care. You know, there's a few things that you see on here and you think, well, let's, you know, uh, I understand caregiving. The number one issue probably we're dealing with right now is being able to find providers of in-care services. You know, we are, our region is really struggling, as well as other areas of the state, but our region is really struggling getting care providers. We've got companies that would take additional clients, but they don't have the workforce. And we've got to figure out how to support that workforce, get more young people involved, understanding, yes, it may not be a, a high-end salary they want to end up and retire on, but early on, they can start in this process. Holly, how many people do, how many different companies do we uh, contract right. with and, and what do you see across the region? Right now we have eight agencies that we contract with to provide in-home services. We only have, I believe of those eight, there's just one of those that serve all 14 counties here in the Upper Cumberland. So some of them will serve maybe just two or three counties. I am excited to say that we do have two new ones coming on board with UCHRA being one of them. Um, so there, there is some, some light a little bit being shed on this issue. But um, the, also, I, I must say that the TCARE actually is the entity that sets those rates for the state. And they are looking at increasing the rates once again. They have recently, over the last year and a half or two, increased the rates a couple of times, which has helped. Um, and it looks like there's a, a good chance those rates will go up again, which is very needed. So the, the providers are experiencing some benefits as it relates to that, but there still is a need there. Yes. I, I won't look around the room. You don't have to raise your hand. How many people in this room do you think is caring for uh, a senior of some type, a parent or some other type of relative or neighbor? I know I'm going through that with, with my father-in-law right now because we don't have enough people providing the care through the, the, the normal processes, that puts that burden even more on uh, other individuals and, and affecting their ability to work as well. Uh, you know, one of the things that we talked about, she talked about the uh, age-friendly community, and that's one that we're really looking at of, of making a push in the Upper Cumberland. We are very fortunate, obviously, Cumberland County, across Wall, because of the retirement setting has went through that process of becoming an age-friendly community. Livingston has also done that as well. We want to see if we can push that all across the Upper Cumberland. The, and what that means is we, we incorporate into policies and in decisions how to take in effect the effect on, on our senior population. So uh, having the ability to have more uh, development for residential, those type of things, uh, is where that comes into play. And then the other thing, I'm gonna tell you, just one thing we're dealing with, we all these, we talk about this all the time. Our senior population is different from where it's been in the past. Now, they're far more mobile, they're far more technologically savvy. Uh, it's just a different senior population than, than probably 20, 30 years ago. You see people are living longer and they're in a lot of ways able to stay mobile and do things. So our programs have to adapt along that with along with that. And one that we're getting ready to roll out and, and Holly's been working on, uh, every community has a senior center. Some of you may go to the senior centers. Talk a little bit about what we're trying to do uh, with our senior centers coming up. Okay. So for many years, 
I've worked here for um, for 20, 30 years, and I think as long as I've been working here, there's been discussions about rebranding senior center to remove the term senior from the names of those centers so that it is more conducive to the older adult population wanting to come through those doors. So many times we have heard um, those who are in their 80s even say, I'm not old enough to go to the senior center. <laughs> or I, maybe I am, but I am not going to be considered a senior. So we are going through the process right now of surveying stakeholders in regards to this rebranding process. We just started it, so we're in the early stages of this. We started out by surveying our senior center directors, um, asking them to survey their boards, their city and county mayors, etc. And then we're, we're collecting, actually analyzing that data this week, and then we're going to be looking at developing another survey that would be for the general public. Um, so it's, you know, it's a process that we're going through. <coughs> this is something some other states have already, have already made these changes. They reap the benefits by seeing some growth at those centers as a result of that. Uh, centers are more focused on health-related activities these days than what they used to be when, when they were first established. And so we're, we have tossed out some <coughs> possible names for them to vote on um, that incorporates that wellness or that health component in the name of it. Um, we are also open to suggestions. So on the survey, we have left a field for them to provide suggestions on something that, that maybe we haven't thought about, which has already been beneficial. So we'll see how this moves along the path. Um, we are very excited to think that, you know, at I'll say that since COVID has occurred and centers were closed during a period of time after they reopened, it's been hard for them to rebound and for that population to want to come back together collectively, <coughs> eat together, etc. And so we're thinking that this is really an ideal time to make these changes. If those centers want to, this is a great time. Let's, let's come up with this new name. We have American Rescue Plan funds that we can use to help pay for the costs that are gonna be incurred in the rebranding, new signage, et cetera. And we want to make this a big deal. Let's do great reopenings at these centers and really try to draw people in through those doors who have just never come to the centers before. That's brilliant. <laughs> Y'all should change the name. <laughs> Sometimes they try to hand me a senior coffee at McDonald's. I'm like, no way I'm taking that. So, around the table here, what are some, are you identifying some needs of that senior population that, that may be new or different, something that you've not seen in the past? Is there something we need to put out on the, the table and, and make suggestions up to uh, Anna Lee as, as she's going through this planning process? I think the nutritious meal is number one. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. A lot of people 59, 55 don't have that either. Right. Yeah. Right. That's very good. That's key. What else? Any other? You know, a lot of these uh, seniors, <clears throat> which I, I relate more so, I'm 70 years old and I've never gone in and ordered a senior coffee. <laughs> I, I, I just don't want to feel like that. Right. But, uh, we need to add pickleball to our senior centers. I mean, that's a sport that older people love yeah. and can play. Mm -hmm. And I tell you, they, they, they really participate in that. And so, you know, we're hoping to get that. We've got a new senior center going to open up, you know, and yeah. move from the old one. So mm -hmm. hopefully yes. that's one of those things that we can add, some little more of those activities. The White County Center is in the process of, of Opening up a pickleball yeah. court there, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Indoor, indoor court. Yeah, we we've done. No. Yeah. What was it we did a few years ago? The tai, the the tai chi. Tai chi. Yeah. We, we've done right. stuff like that as well. So. Yeah. What else? What other suggestions? I thought a bike ride was good. What? A bike ride? Maybe there's some here, but I don't know if it's for targeted for like more senior. Yeah, since people are more active, they're like 
stay on the list of kayaks so you mentioned kind of mm -hmm. also pouting with more passive I think we've got to be open to stuff like that but with this change in dynamic we can't just sit back and offer the same programs we always offer mm -hmm. because it's it's not going to attract people in and, and that the key is the social factor that's why we mm -hmm. put such emphasis on the on the senior centers is to get people together uh, and the more if you ever get them there you get them hooked that's right. so. any other thoughts or comments it's not the one place you'll see them or this funeral home <laughs> Two places. <laughs> we don't want to go to school. <laughs> but I would agree with you as far as the, uh, the concern for um, people wanting to be caregivers. You know, like you said, the pay is not exciting. My mother was actually um, a caregiver for over 20 years at a local nursing home. And to go in and see the job that she did and to see, I think they're grossly underpaid for what they do. Um, she recently had knee surgery, and so I went in to, to try to help her, and it was like, wow, <laughs> you know, I'm not cut out to do this kind of work. So, you know, the people that are caregivers, you know, it's the good ones, you know, they go in and they care for those people, and, and you know, my thoughts with her were, um, you know, she didn't have her family taking care of her, you know, what are these other people doing, you know, they maybe they can't afford caregivers to come in and help them after they've had surgery, or you know, things like that. I, I think that's a, a great concern. Um, uh, you know, and not that I know that even if what you do could help improve the wages for these caregivers, you know, and that maybe that people would move more into that field, you know, to become caregivers. And so, but it's just a concern that, um, you know, whenever she was in the hospital, they asked now, when you go home, who's going to be there with you? When you think about all the people that they have no one to go home with them and to be there to help them. I think that would be a great concern. The key on the caregiver role is, as a, as a society, we've got to place value on that. And we've got to say that is a key mm -hmm. component to, to the health of our loved ones. And we have to be vocal in that saying it's got to be viewed as a, a more professional. Too often, some professions, some jobs get left behind as others progress up, and, and that's probably one that's just been overlooked over the years. And, but we, as a society, we've got to say that's a vital component, and we need. Is there any kind of consistent uh, training or core training requirements for that in home help? Is there any home assistant agency? Yes, yes. So, um, what I, I'm Picking up on themes, which Marshall, I think, knows. So definitely here in prevention, right? So if I can help with my health now, I might prevent future planning, right? So if I can plan now, maybe my daughter can help me when I have a knee replacement, but maybe not, and you know, things like that. And then with the workforce. So um, we have, and, and remember, the, the workforce that, that we deal with is, um, we have about 400 providers that do, that are contracted for Medicaid, long-term supports and services, and home and community-based services. And then Holly's got a few more providers that will do um, the, the Medicare side that are Medicaid. Mm -hmm. um, but we hear and have heard for the past five plus years that the consistent training is one of those reasons why people leave, uh, leave this. Sometimes it's the wages, but most of the time it's I didn't feel prepared, I don't feel um, equipped. And in some instances, where you, I, I love what you said, if you say this isn't for me, that's that's great. It, that's that's a, that's a step, right? But if it is for you, then we want to support you uh, through through quality training. Um, we we do have, which actually you see, um, HRA is a partner in this. Um, we do have some training uh, initiatives right now. We're helping professionalize the profession with the national certification. Uh, we are incentivizing both providers and the direct care professionals to get that national certification. Um, be up to four thousand uh, dollars as a, as an incentive. Um, it's with that ARPA money, so it's time limited. But really seeing if that 
and how to support providers and, and caregivers uh, through this. So it's kind of the training efforts, kind of the wages, and maybe marrying those together. And I can speak just a little bit on the non-Medicaid side. You guys remember we talked about how with our in-home services, we partnered with the Tennessee Board of Regents using some of the quilt. Um, and so we have two staff right now, two new staff that are going through that because that's what we, it's lack of consistent training. Mm -hmm. So we've started, but we have another component where we're trying to partner with the TCATs so that this module could actually be stackable credits for someone as us being the last payer. So we're looking at it from the non-Medicaid side, how can we boost up that training and let turn this into a career, mm -hmm. right? Because it can be a, a career. Um, so that's how we're working through that portion of the non-Medicaid side. The, the last thing on this list of the goals, and, and sometimes we, we, we take some of these for granted, the last one is the security and pr uh, protection. I'm going to tell you, we're in a society right now where our seniors are being preyed upon by scam artists and criminals more than they ever have. And that's an area where we've got to do a better job uh, of working through programs and making sure our seniors understand how to protect themselves. That's the problem. So often they don't know how to protect themselves. Uh, and we've got great partners. I know our banking partners have stepped up to the plate uh, and, and assisted in that process, but we've got to do as a region uh, a better job at doing that as well. So, any other thoughts or comments? This has been great. We love the discussion. <laughs> and just picking back off that, the scammers, they're getting more savvy. Just last night, I was trying to check on the balance on my Health Flex, you know, account. And I dialed a six rather than a zero. So when this person answered, it was like, first it was automated and it said, all right, if you're over 50, press two because we've got an exciting offer for you. Well, at first I was like, that's kind of weird, but I pressed one because I wasn't over 50. Then they start talking to me about an alert system, and I'm like, okay, I, something's not right. So I'm looking to see what did I do. Well, about the time I was and realized I called the wrong number, this lady, live person, picked up and she said, "This is Jamie. I'm having a hard time. Could you verify that you can hear me?" And you say yes. <laughs> so if I would have been yes, then they, I would have owned a back brace. I think it was what they were. We're saying. Oh. Um, so then I realized I just hung up because I dialed the wrong number. But think about that. Even me, I was like, oh, I'm not over 50. I hit one that I was going to write at it. But um, so that's how savvy you would. And you would have said, no, I can hear you. Yes, I can hear you. Mm -hmm. And, and that's you all would have, then I would have had a back break. Yeah. The, the way to prevent that, though, is Linnell telling, because I trust Linnell. I hear Linnell. Yes. And like, we run into this all the time where you, you try to do like a big campaign, but that's answering the phone. No, we don't want you to do that. So it's like, that's really where a local face-to-face, uh, -face, that kind of trusted, um, is really that security and protection could really help. Because prevention My home phone sounds out of the area, I don't like it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Any, any other discussion? Let me just real quick to make sure that you all see in your packets this information right here. This is actually the, 2000, the 2022 um, state aging profile data specifically for the Upper Cumberland region. I did, there is a, a one sheet on the front that does provide some demographic information for the state of Tennessee. The rest of this in here is broken down by county, so I thought you all might find that of interest. Um, the Tennessee Commission on Aging Disability typically puts this report out each year. We have not received the 2023 report just yet, but this is, I think, interesting information um, as it relates to the number of individuals in the state and by county as to who are grandparents raising grandchildren, those older adults who are living um, in poverty, the number of veterans, those who, who do not have a vehicle, do not drive, um, how many are on Medicare, how many are considered cost burden homeowners. So lots of great information here. And then if you, let's see, let me make sure I reference the first page here. If you look to the very back, the very last page, 
there is a sheet that says county level statistics. Looks like this. And I think this is very interesting. Just for example, um, if you look in the second category on the left hand column there, it says 10 year population growth rate. And this really just reiterates what Annalise shared with us. We actually have four out of the top five counties in the state that are, that are experiencing the highest rate of growth um, in the older adult population over the next few years. So um, the ones that are here in the Upper Cumberland are highlighted on here. Uh, very interesting information to me. I thought you all might find that interesting. Well. New business to bring up. Any old business? Public comments. Have any? You want? You know, now at our city meetings, we're required to open up for public comments, mm -hmm. and we do it at the beginning. Supposedly, it's supposed to be about what's on the agenda, but. We're a small community, and if they want to talk, we allow them to. And so, but that's a new requirement that we, that we have, which is good. I know, uh, Christian, you've got an event coming up Friday. I don't know if that's closed already or. Uh, no, no, it's our um, annual legislative breakfast. As we have our um, legislators from our district here in the Upper Cumberland have been invited to attend, along with former U.S. Uh, Representative uh, Diane Black, will be um, the speaker. Uh, Peter Koch from the U.S. Uh, Representative Haggerty's office will be with us as well. And then we have some other um, speakers you know, first as well. But it's always a really a good event. Um, it's an opportunity to hear from our legislators and to ask questions. Um, it's going to be right here. It's the beginning at 8.30. Uh, we're having breakfast. The uh, culinary arts students from uh, Southern High School will be catering the event. So we're excited about that. Um, our theme this year is civics. And we're honoring a um, award recipient here in the Upper Cumberland area, um, Alana uh, Ileana uh, Page. From, uh, she's a fifth grader in Detroit, and she won the statewide trade contest for civilian that's So we're going to do a presentation of recognition for her as well. So, and if I may, on um, April uh, yeah, 17th, uh, in collaboration with Power of Putnam, we are hosting JC Worrell. She is the executive director of the um, Girl Health Association, so she'll be coming and doing a lunch and learn. It'll be at my office, which is where I talk to most of the time, from 11 to 12, and it's also a free event. And Bill, I don't know if you wanted to say anything else about that. No, I don't know how it's filling up, but if you're interested in that, um, go ahead and get on the event where I can sign up. Can you see my, okay, I do have flyers. So if you have the flyer for that, and I do have flyers with a um, QR code, and this is about JC. So she's going to be covering uh, substance use uh, disorder, maternal health, emergency preparedness, and then also rural health access here in the Upper Cumberland. So um, all are welcome. It is free event. So I will leave you out if you'd like to take one. Um, Your Substance Abuse Prevention Coalition, Power Cut will be tomorrow at 11 at the beautiful new football field apartment. Everybody's and if I may, just have one. we have a couple of upcoming events too in uh, May. Uh, well, one is in April, it's Child Abuse Awareness Training, and that's also here at the Development District, and that's on the 15th. It's the Drug Abuse with Children Committee from the Power Program who are hosting that event. It's also free, and there'll be resource tables as well. Um, and that's from 8 to 12. And then we have a Save the Dates. We're doing identifying and managing anxiety in children and youth. Um, and that's going to be May 29th in collaboration with uh, Ms. Stamps here at Foster and Hazel Hawk and Mark Anderson with uh, TRCM. More information about that. Well, thank you. Thank you. Anything else? <laughs> if not, entertain the motion to adjourn. Motion, we adjourn. <laughs> motion. Second. Second. Let's go home.